Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel according to John chapter 1. Where we continue to look at the passage found in verses 14 through 18. We are reading this morning only verses 14 and 18. We're reading this morning only verses 14 and 18 of John chapter 1. And it reads, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18 No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that You, the triune God, You have revealed Yourself unto us through the Son, and by your Spirit. Oh, Father, we pray that today you may, through your Word and Spirit, draw us into this mystery of your being three in one. And Father, not just as a theological exercise, but to see its implications for our union with you. We thank you, Father. Father, we depend on you to open our hearts to enlightening and understanding and to warm our affections. Do it again by the power of your word and spirit. Father, forgive us our sins. Forgive the sins of the one that preaches, for there are many. Cleanse us and make us grow. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. If you look at the outline in the bulletin, you're, you're see, you can see how we are advancing in this um, uh, teaching. We have already seen in, on item number one, point number one in your outline, how the Word dwelt among us. And He came to us when we were not looking for Him. When the world was in darkness, when our hearts were in darkness. When we were dead in sins and trespasses, the Word came to us, dwelt among us, literally pitched His tents among us, tabernacled, came to live with men. And that shows God's rescue of mercy. We were not looking for Him. We were condemned. We were lost in sin and rebellion. And God came into this world with a mercy rescue. We also saw that that God became flesh. Not only did He come to rescue us by, if you will, throw us a life preserver that from a distance somehow lend us a hand, but we have also meditated on the truth that He became one of us, that He became like us, that He became flesh, And that He walked in our burdens, in our shoes. And He became our burden bearer to bring us back to God. We also read last Sunday that we beheld His glory. The glory of the Son as of the one that's the only man that's kept the covenant. We read in Matthew 5 and highlighted the perfection of the law. The glories of God manifested in the perfection of Christ's covenant keeping. That He is the only one that has ever been able to keep the law of God. To render unto God perfect obedience. And He has done that for us who never on this side of eternity will be able to render unto God perfect obedience because of our flesh. He came to be the glory of God for us, our covenant 
keeper. And now we come today to hearing in this passage that he is the only begotten of the Father and that he is in the bosom of the Father. And I want to submit to you this morning that Jesus Christ came to give us a mercy rescue, to become a covenant keeper for us, but also to do more. He came to show us the glory of the Father and also to make us partakers in that glory. To bring us into what God the Father, Son, and Spirit have. What do they have? They have perfect fellowship. The Trinity is about God's glory and in His being, the God that is in perfect relationship, fellowship, communion, delight, pleasure within Himself. He is life. He is blessedness. Within the bosom of the Trinity, there is an endless and eternal exchange of love, of fellowship, of communion, of delight, of pleasure. That is life. And God, in His grace and mercy, it has been His will to bring us into that communion. To make us participants in his life. To draw us into the rest, the blessedness, the life, the pleasures that are within his being. He draws us then in Christ unto that reality, unto that being. I'd like to begin by, by showing and speaking a little bit of this only begotten of the Father, Christ Jesus. And the fact that in this chapter, we see that this only begotten is the only one of his kind. That's what only begotten mean. When it says that we, we have seen the glory of the only, verse 14, of the only begotten of the Father. The word in the Greek is monogenes, which, which talks about a relationship in which one is unique, uniquely the same as the other. He is the only begotten, not in the sense that some people speak in error, that Christ had a beginning, that he was begotten in the sense that he came to be, but there was a time when he was not, that is not what scripture is signifying by that word. He is signifying that Christ is of the Father, the only of its kind. The only that is like the Father, uniquely like the Father. That's why we hear in Hebrews that the Son is the exact representation or copy or image of the Father. So when Jesus Christ came to us, God came down to us. The exact representation of who God is, the exact image of who God is, walked among us, lived among us, in order to draw us into that relationship. Let me show you in Matthew chapter 28, how there is an identification between the Father, the Son, and in this passage, we see the Father and the Son beginning in John 1. Before going to Matthew, we hear in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? That's talking about Christ, the Logos. He was, notice, with God, and He was God. He was divine. He was, he was the only one like the Father. Why? The answer is because He is God like the Father. Let me show you that is why. So what are the implications of that? Because this also applies to the Holy Spirit. There are some that would say the Holy Spirit is nothing but 
an active force, but not a person. But none of us are saved by an active force, a blind force, an impersonal force. We are saved by God. We are saved through union with God. If God were to leave us to ourselves, we perish. But God has been pleased to draw us into His life, to unite us with Him in Christ by means of the Holy Spirit who reveals Christ to us. Where do we see this in a very significant way? If you go to the end of Matthew chapter 28, in the Great Commission, we hear the following. Matthew chapter 28, at the end of Matthew, verses 28, 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name. Now, what is the meaning of baptism? Have you ever thought about baptism? What baptism represents? Baptism represents union, identification. For example, when the Bible says that all the people were baptized into Moses in the Exodus, what does that mean? It means that by walking with him, by following him, they were identified with Moses. They were united to Moses' work. Baptism implies the idea of union. In our baptistical language, we say immersion. And, and that's a very good uh, illustration because there is not a better way to be united with something or someone than to be what? Immersed into someone or something. When you are soaked, for example, this was also used of certain um, clothing that you would dye, you would use a coloring agent, and you would soak that piece of cloth or clothing, apparel, into that coloring, and then it would receive, right, the color of that dye. It was united, it was immersed with the properties of that coloring agent. So baptism represents union. It represents identity, being together with. Obviously, it even speaks more because it is union in the death and the resurrection of Christ. In other words, what's the death and resurrection of Christ? The work of Christ by which we live. So when it says is death and rising, it means to say we have been united, identified, immersed, inseparably connected, united with the work of Christ for us. And what's the result of that? Cleansing. Cleansing which is the other um, signification of baptism, union and cleansing. That is why it is identified in Colossians with circumcision. The idea of circumcision literally is a cutting off, but the spiritual signification of circumcision is what? Is cleansing filth, is putting off filth. So the Bible says, that God, that you need to circumcise your hearts. What does that mean? You need to clean your heart. You need to cleanse your heart. You need to, literally what he's saying is, you need to make yourself holy. But who can make himself holy? Who can cleanse his own way before God? Who can justify himself before God? None can. But the covenant keeper came so that in order to, with his holiness, being the perfect Lamb of God. That is why the Lamb of God had to be without spot, without blemish, without anything that would be sinful. And the Lamb of God was sinless. And in His living before God perfectly and becoming the offering for our sins and rising, then we are united. Meaning we're baptized into the work of God. We are then cleansed of our sins. How? 
because all that he is is now mine. And God counts it as mine by faith because we are united with Christ. Because we are one with him. Because we, are, we have been baptized into Christ. But it's very interesting that in Matthew chapter 28, we see the baptismal formula with the three persons of the Trinity. As if to say, when you are united with the Father, you're united with whom? With the Son. And when you are united with the Son, you are united with whom? With the Holy Spirit. As if to say, if you're going to be saved in the Father, you're going to be saved in the Son. And you're going to be saved in the Holy Spirit. As if to say, salvation is only of God. It is not your project. It is not of you. It is only of God. And God works this salvation for you. And this salvation is of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. No creature can save you. No angelic, exalted being could save you. No creature has the intrinsic righteousness to save you. Only the God who has life in Himself can unite you to Himself and hence cause the dead to live. So you see here in this formula, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that Christ is identifying Himself and His Spirit with the Father and say, you're going to be saved by being united with us or with God, with the three persons that live in the bosom of the, of the Trinity, of the one God. I have come so that in the flesh I can speak of this union unto you. So that in the flesh I can begin to testify to you of delight, of fellowship, of communion, of pleasure, of blessedness, of peace, the shalom of God which is who God is. And in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are all that and enjoy all that, you will be saved. And what it means is, not just that we have a ticket for heaven, it's that we are drawn into the plenitude, the fullness, the richness of this life. Not exciting? Literally, as the hymn says, he walks with me. And talks with me along life's narrow way. How is that possible? Because we have been united with God. With the triune God. We have been drawn into the everlasting. And to speak in, in, a, in a folklore language. Vulgar language, so to speak. We have been drawn into the everlasting party of the one God. How many of us like a good party? Yeah, that's right. How many of us? Because what's the idea of a party? We enjoy, we celebrate, we are enlivened, right? We share, we eat, we drink, we become merry, right? We forget our burdens, right? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Don't be party poopers. <laughs> I'm not talking about the world's party. See, the Satan that lives in the world and throws his own party, these are parties for death because they lead you away from God. And they present something to you outside of God that promises all this but can deliver. Can deliver. That's why Mick Jagger had to sing, I have found, I can find no satisfaction. <laughs> and man, did he party. The party of the flesh will never lead to the party of God. Oh, but I'm here to tell you that there is a party. There is one party that we have been summoned to, invited to, drawn to, wooed into, transformed into, foretasted of, begun to enjoy and to delight in. 
And it is that everlasting rest, glory, power, beauty, blessedness. Just keep putting adjectives to that. We run, language is not enough to describe who God is and the glory of God. That's why Paul had to say, hey, hey, listen, the sufferings of the present time, they're not worthy to be compared with a party of God. Not worthy to be compared with the glories that shall be revealed. Where is that glory? In the bosom of the Trinity. In the fellowship. In the communion of all that God is within Himself. That God shares in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. And in that perfect communion, friendship, so to speak, of these three subsistences the language of the confession and of the creeds because language fails to explain this mystery. This mystery of who God is in Himself. But we can hear that God is plurality in union. Plurality in union. In other words, God is relational. Relational. God is sharing and communicating of Himself. That's who God is. God is love. What does that mean? The Bible says in Colossians that love is the bond of perfection. Well, for there to be love, there's got to be someone to be bound with, right? There's got to be a relationship. There has to be a plurality in one. And this plurality of one is one in which they share perfectly all the attributes of who they are. In other words, what the Father is, the Son is, the Holy Spirit is. What you can predicate of the Father, in other words, if you say the Father is holy, you can say... The Son is holy, and the Holy Spirit is holy. If you find another predicate and say, the Father is merciful, you can say, the Son is merciful, the Holy Spirit is merciful. If you say, the Father is almighty, you say, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty. If you say, the Father is all-knowing, He knows all things, you can say, the Son knows all things, the Spirit knows all things. In other words, The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And they are one. But, we also say this. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father. They are differentiated insofar as they are are related to one another in their own person, but they are equal and the same insofar as they share the same essence, so to speak, to find a word to talk about that, of divinity. The same attributes, the same qualities of who God is can be predicated of the three persons of the Trinity. And let me tell you now, there is no one like God. No one like Him. Why? Because God is. See, all those predications or predicates, they don't tell you about something that God has. For example, I say, you know, I have a key. But this key and me are not the same thing. Right? They're not the same thing. This is not my essence. Even of, even of qualities, if I say... Um, right now I am acting to you in a loving manner. But love is not who I am. You see that? It is something that characterizes me at some point. But it is not the essence of what? Of who I am. Now, it's different with God. Whatsoever we predicate of God, that's who He is in his essence so god doesn't have love god what is love 
God doesn't have mercy. God is mercy. God doesn't have justice as when a judge acts, for example, following the law and being a dispenser of justice. No, God is justice. I wonder if you're beginning to hear echoes in the biblical record. For example, if we go to Exodus, Exodus 3. Say, well, what does this have to do with us? What does theology have to do with us? What does the knowledge of God have to do with us? Everything. Let me show you. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> we have a very practical situation. Moses, who is suffering with his people, and God has called him to go and proclaim freedom to the captives and to lead the people out of slavery. What's necessary for that? To go on your own before Pharaoh? To go on your own before your enslaver? The one that has you and your people in bondage and has all power, humanly speaking. What is necessary? To go in boldness before such an enemy. To know that there is one greater. To know that there is one greater. That not only has power, but is power. That not only has wisdom, but is wisdom. That not only has resources, but is all resources and life within himself. You see how that changes things? How do we face our enemy? How do we overcome the obstacles? How do we live in this life in our pilgrimage? By knowing one who is for us. And that's what Moses comes to find out here in Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Then Moses said to, said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your father has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? Because they know Pharaoh. They know who has them captive. And if you come to me and you say, Well, I'm coming to you in Moses' name. Or in some, at that time, Pharaoh was one of the most powerful um, Rulers in the world. Who could, who could face Pharaoh? In other words, Moses knew that when he went to the people and said, Hey, I have come to be an instrument to set you free. I'm going to say, In whose power? Who dares come before Pharaoh? Who in the world has the power, the resources to overthrow our enemy? Oh, that preaches right there, doesn't it? Who does? Verse 14, and God says to Moses, I am who I am. <laughs> the power of the name. I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am. You could show me many things that you have, but you're not. I am. The enemy can come with great power and great resources and, and much evil scheming. And there could come great tribulations and the enemy could have many armies and many bonfires and much threatening and much affliction. But they're not. I am. I am is with me and for me. And if I am is with me and for me, we shall overcome. You see the connection with the Trinity? <laughs> you see how we come to the Trinity? We shall overcome. As a matter of fact, I am begins to say, you are more than an overcomer. More. You're more than a conqueror. We begin to say and look at this world and say, nothing in this world can Slay us. Can, can make us fall. Nothing in this world, as Paul would say in Romans 11, 
shall be able to separate me from the love of God. There's no, there's no hell, there's no demon, there's no Satan, there's no power, there is no present circumstance, there is no past, there's no future circumstance, there's nothing that will be able to separate me from the love of God. And how have I come to know the love of God? The great I am who is for me and is with me and is in me. Moses comes to know that. And now we read in John, and now we connect Old Testament with New Testament of somebody that comes claiming the same name and saying, I am. I am? You are? Wait a second. Israel knew who I am was. And I am was not I was. I am is always and remains what? I am. Let us now go to John chapter 8. Go to John chapter 8. And here in John chapter 8, the words of Jesus. Now he speaks about Abraham that the Jews had so much respect for and identified with. They, were ident they identified themselves with the fathers, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Moses. But if they only identify themselves with a man, they fell short and they would die in their sins. Because now before them was more than Abraham, more than Isaac, more than Jacob, more than Moses. Before them was the great I am. And he tells them, verse 56 of John chapter 8, Then the Jews said to him, You're not yet 50 years old. Oh, verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, get ready folks, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> Glory to God. And there he told them who he was, the monogenese, the only begotten, the only one of the same kind as the Father. Divinity unveiled me flesh in their presence. And because they knew that he had now pronounced and made himself like God, they immediately, as being good lawyers, think of Leviticus and the penalty for blasphemy. And what is that penalty? Death by stoning. And what do they want to do now? Then they took up stones to throw at him. And Jesus hid, hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. A great I am cannot be held by human hands. But the great I am became flesh and allowed himself to be held by human hands so that he could deliver you and I. So that he could set us free. So that he could draw us into communion with him and that we would pass by all the obstacles and devils and fiends and enemies and tribulations and trials so that no flood would ever overtake us. The flood or fire so that nothing in this world would keep us from going through and going by and passing by unto Him and unto perfect fellowship with Him and unto the rest of friendship with Him and communion with Him and delight with Him and happiness with Him. He is the great I Am. Jesus Christ. That's why in this book of John, read the book of John, and you're going to hear all the declarations of the I am. I mean, come on, let's just think about it for a moment. Think about it. I am the good shepherd, right? I am the door of the sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am living water. I am the vine. All the statements that Jesus made pronouncing, I am everything that you as a human need and your soul craves wrongly, 
outside of God, the great I am has for you. The longings, the fears, the insecurities, the rebellions of the human condition. We have, we have, we're lost in our sins. We have turned our backs on the great I am. And the great I am continues to say, I am who you need. I am the one that you need by your side. I am the one that can satisfy and quench your thirst, your hunger, the longings of your heart. They are misdirected. They are misguided. So you see, we humans do not content ourselves with anything in this world. The more we get, the more we want. There's, a, there's an insatiable unquenchable hunger and thirst in the human kind. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that it is God who put it there. It is a testimony to God, to the who I am, because we're not. And the problem of the human kind is that we turn our backs on he who is on the great I am to now turn and say, we are. I am. I don't need God. And that is wilderness land. Because you have nothing of yourself. You are nothing of yourself. So in order to come and find the who I am for you, you must die to self. What is dying? I was going to think, dying to self. I've got, I've got to do something religious. I've got to fast. I've got to pray. I've got to do all these things to die to self. You just got to believe that you're not. Starts there. Believe. Repent about who you thought you are. In your own resources and doing and works, repent of that. And by faith, find life for you in the great I am. Ah, oh, tell you what I found. That the most liberated thing is to find the God that is for me. And not be trying to be a God. It's to find that my identity is not based on my performance on my doing, on my titles, or my degrees, or my accomplishments, of my pursuits, or my holiness, or my religious works. My identity is in someone else that is for me. Folks, that is grace. That's the power of grace. That when you come weary and tired of your own self-driven, performance-based attempts of finding an identity in yourself, at finding satisfaction, at finding peace, at finding the party. Every time you're going to a party that is performance-based, that is based on what you do and you bring your accomplishments, your things, your doings, a party. It's ruined and becomes a nightmare. Because your flesh will never satisfy your flesh. But the glory of God will. When by the Spirit of God, He, he throws you upon Himself with no plea, with nothing of your own. He throws you upon Himself bare and naked. That's why I think Adam and Eve were naked. It was, not, it was not just a sexual thing, right? Sometimes we just go there. That nakedness spoke of dependence utterly and completely on God. What happened as soon as, as, soon as they sinned, they wanted to fabricate for themselves something. 
of their own resources. They wanted to fix their problem. But when they were naked, they had no problem. <laughs> when they were totally cast upon God for all their needs and for all their being and for their identity, there was no problem. It was fully cast on the loving kindness of a benevolent God that is for me. And that's a Christian life now. As we begin to know who God is by faith and who God is for me by faith, we are, and we shall say more about this uh, next Sunday, we are then transformed. Folks, we don't change ourselves. This is not our own doing. This is not our consent to God. That's why we are Christians, and by saying that, Reformed Christians, by saying that, we want to say, we don't believe that our will our, and our consent is the determining factor. We don't reign by our will, nor do we have to Give God permission for him to do something because he is. And when he wants to do something, guess what? He'll do it. He'll do it. And what he does is that then he takes the will that was enslaved. And this is, our time is out, but we'll come back to it. This was the main insight of the Reformation. The difference between medieval spirituality and re reformed spirituality is the difference between a spirituality that looked to God to provide a power and a help that when we can send to it, then we advance spiritually. It was the difference of Thomas Aquinas, um, Erasmus, Scotus. These are leading thinkers of medieval spirituality. What was the basis of their system? They talk about grace. They did. But this is the way it worked. God puts his grace. He provides a help. But again, what do we have in our popular saying? God helps who? That's medieval spirituality at its best. That's human nature. That's what the Middle Ages did, taking the Bible in the wrong direction. And it was the mother of all heresies, of all kinds of bad practices. Say, okay, God helps, but now by my will, by my will, I must consent to it. And if I consent to it by somehow doing, responding, doing works of penance, doing something to cooperate with that grace, then God gives me sanctifying grace. And then I acquire merit before God. But there comes a monk by the name of Luther that puts a kink in this whole system by saying, yeah, he said we're saved by faith, but let me tell you something that's even deeper, by saying the will of man is enslaved to sin. That did it. The will of man can do nothing of its own. It has to be changed by God. He who is a slave of sin cannot change himself. God must come and bring freedom to a slave. And that's what God has done for us. He has set us free. He has set us free when we were enslaved. Our consents, our wills, our affections are all the doings of God's grace. And for that we worship him. And for that we thank him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Oh, there's so much, so much richness here in this word, oh God. And we are excited to plunge further into it. 
And Father, we pray that we may continue by your word and spirit to be transformed unto the image of your Son. Father, Father, now let this word dwell richly in our hearts. Father, that we may receive comfort and consolation and hear your word of forgiveness. That your peace may guard our hearts in Christ Jesus now and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen and Amen.